Standing by Thomas McClure. I may be broke with barely a penny to my person, but my heart is of pure pounding gold, I assure you that. Are you talking to a vending machine? I froze. Oh God, I thought I was alone out here. Everything stopped as my heart tried to escape me. The cold night air seemed to stop blowing and instead arrested me in my place. In a moment, I went from blissfully unaware to hypersensitive about everything. From the icy sweat on my neck to my tight, uncomfortable underclothes, my vision grew drunk as all I could focus on was every little jet of my body made. I must have looked ridiculous. No. I started turning towards them. All right, then. The voice smiled, unconvinced. Well, you can't just stand here. You need to hide. They'll be coming soon. Come with me, in here. It took a second for the words to register in my head. I was too caught in the context of what was happening. Were they looking for me for something? Did I do something wrong? Were they from a party or just a passerby? Wait, I know them. This person, Alan, was from the party, but we hadn't talked. Alan? I saw it written down, but never caught anyone saying it out loud. Was that right, Alan? Do you pronounce the two A's? Alan? 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 Oh, hell, just don't say anything. Alan strutted forward with the purpose, and I realised I hadn't processed what he'd said. I had heard it, but not understood it. Something was happening. What did I do wrong? Hide? Coming? What? Oh, the game. Why we were out here. The game. Oh, I'm not. It was too late. They had taken me by the hand and pulled me across the street, rushing me into an old phone booth. It would be rude to push away, to try and slip past them. What if I hurt them? What if I touched them and they didn't like it? What if I came off as rude and got kicked from the party? What if everyone started talking about me and looking at me and thinking bad things about me? No, I had to give in to what was happening, just for a moment. Couldn't be rude. I quickly started looking up and around the booth, avoiding Alan just in case they thought I was staring in case I made them feel self-conscious. It was one of those old phone booths, but this one was redecorated and repurposed. It was far from traditional. The back wall was lined with shelves of free books and the other three sides of the windows heavily tinted black. At first, the frame looked all white, but as my eyes acclimated, I realised it was creamy with faint golden outlines. I didn't get a great look until the burning light from above had started to hurt my eyes. I didn't want to look like an overwhelmed puppy. I turned to Alan who pulled the door shut and I grabbed a book to inspect, almost as if I wanted to seem like I was coming in here anyway, which, as I pretended to read the cover, it dawned on me that it didn't make any sense at all. Though putting it back would be even more awkward, so I changed the mental subject and started thinking of how to get out of this situation. You okay? Alan asked. Okay. Paul's outlining my plan. I have to respond. I turned to them, book in hand, and eyes transfixed on a pane of glass right over their shoulder. Yeah, yeah, I just wasn't. Oh, what words do I use? I can't say I wasn't playing because I came out with everyone else to play. Can't say I wasn't expecting them, that could be rude. Can't start the sentence again, that's weird. Say something, oh, I'm sure I'll think of something later tonight when I'm in bed. It will probably be witty and charismatic as hell too. I could say thinking, no, that's too pretentious. Expecting, no, I already thought of that. Wondering, oh, now it's just any word coming into your head. You weren't expecting to be dragged in here, were you? Yes. Nah, it's fun. It's fine. I mean, just uh, a little swept off my feet, that's all. Oh, really? Alan said. Steady on there, we only just met. Oh. Oh, no, I'm not. I wasn't. Just a thing. Not that I wouldn't, but not that I am. This is... I'll stop talking. Alan placed a hand on mine and gave me a polite smile. It's okay. It helped for a second. The hand was warm. It, they weren't holding me aggressively or dismissively. It was gentle and reassuring. Their thumb rubbed at my fingers a little. It was smooth and light. I didn't hate it. I actually sort of liked it. I actually sort of really liked it. I hadn't really been spoken to like that in a while, and most of my physical interaction consisted of bumping into people. This was refreshing and warm. My eyes darted away. I reluctantly pulled my hand away before it seemed like I was passive or unresponsive or broken or something. I faced away from them and aimlessly looked down at the book I was holding. Sorry. Alan said, leaning to the side of the small booth, peering their head around to try and see my face. I don't have much of a filter. Just kind of say what's on my mind and push myself into situations because I want to. You were busy doing something and I completely interrupted. Do you want to leave? No. I chortled lightly, slightly turning to them so they didn't have to lean over, so I didn't seem rude. They were only half in the way of the door, but they had just apologised and I didn't want them to feel bad. Plus, I could handle this for a second longer, have a short wee chat and then politely find a reason to leave. I was going to take a book from here and away and then find a hanging spot, so it's all good. I can stay. Oh, okay. Cool, thanks. A smile appeared in the corner of my eyes as I looked straight into the dark glass pane behind them. Alan looked at me for a moment until they eventually turned away, their smile fading. I didn't even know what they really looked like. 
just the general shape and sound and dress me. But I wasn't going to look, definitely not in the eye, not that I didn't want to, of course. From glances and peripheral vision, they looked good, really good. But if I looked at them and made a horrible impression, then it would be a face I, I could never see again. And I don't want that sort of guilt to get on my conscience. I just stared ahead. I didn't want to get into this sort of situation. I leaned against the wall as my vision tried to stabilise. I couldn't socially afford to fall down or pass out right now. My hand subtly reached to the shelf to help hold me up. My eyes followed the painted golden outlines of the stained glass window, keeping my head distracted from the situation I had found myself in. The room was warm, much better than the outside. But what if that's just me? What if I'm super red right now? No, ignore it. It's fine. They're not looking. You're good. Just whatever you do, don't think about how you feel. It's good. You're doing great. Not feeling anxious at all. Not sick in the slightest. Oh god, I thought about sick. And now I'm thinking about it. Do not throw up in here. So. Alan started pulling my mind away from the idiocy as they were peering out the crack in the door. What book did you pick? I looked down at the one in my hand. Karma Sutra. Oh god. I clumsily shoved it back into the slot from whence it came. Oh, I thought it was a different book. Doesn't look very interesting. Oh, well, never mind then. Okie dokie. So, uh. Come on, let's do our bit and get out. Don't you think hide and seek for 20 year olds is a bit weird? Oh my god, no. Abort, abort. What did I just say? Did I just call them childish? I can see the casket already. This is a mess. Alan started laughing and I, trying to seem like I'm not an ass, let out a little laugh. Or, well, more of a chortle through my nose and a laugh without using my mouth. There must be a word for that. A snort? Yeah, it is. Alan replied, bringing me back from my thoughts. What were we talking about? Oh, hide and seek. But it's still kind of fun, especially when half the players are drunk. That's pretty funny. I guess it's like we're kids again, you know? Running around, trying to outsmart each other. A little bit of active banter. I couldn't really relate. I've only played a few games of it in my life and few of them ever went well. Most of the time I'd hide somewhere and wait for up to an hour. And then find out no one was looking for me. I was forgotten. Hide and seek isn't fun if you're never sought. So the final few times I pretended I sucked and made where I was obvious. I was found and got to hang out with them and help look for others. It's better to be easily found than easily forgotten. When I was a kid it wasn't easy to make friends or go out and join in games. But when I had the chance I went all in. Wait, it's not easy to do that now either. That sort of development can't be good. I guess the only real change is the anxiety. Back then I didn't expect rejection, didn't really expect anything. Really just a blank slate. Just confident enough to be clingy. Now I'm neither and barely able to stand when next to someone. I turn my head away from Alan. Sorry. I felt Alan turn to me and stand more attentively. It's fine, you're right. It is childish, that's kind of the point. But also, hey, you're playing it too, so check me, punkazoid. Punkazoid? I couldn't help but chuckle. Who says that? I turned my head a little and retorted. Hey, you're the one who dragged me in here. Yeah, because you were standing by the vending machine not hiding at all. I swept you off your feet because you needed someone to. Plus, I needed a little company. Little dude, it sucks hiding without a partner. Little dude? I said as I faced them, keeping my eyes down to the side and a hand on the shelf to keep my balance. I'm not too bad at this, I don't think. Oh yeah, but a cute little, don't worry. Alan said as they brought a hand up to rub at my head. I swatted it away playfully, or at least not aggressively. Could have done it better. Careful, turtleneck. I tried. Oh, dungarees getting feisty. I'll have you know this is fashionable. Alan laughed. Sure, an extra pocket is really in these days, showing off that you can carry a bit more money than before, right? The height of luxury. Absolutely. Come on, be suave. You got this. I can really flaunt my cash about. Really comes in handy when I'm trying to get his stuff from a vending machine. I snapped my fingers and smiled. Right. <laughs> Except... When I have not a penny to my person. Darn it. Oh yeah, don't you just hate it when that happens? It's the worst. I spend all my copious amounts of money on something to carry in. A classic tragedy. You must be totally in agony right now. Alan leaned in with a fatigued look. You just put the ending of Romeo and Juliet to shame. Shakespeare couldn't imagine the pain I'm in. Oh, I bet. Someone shouted something outside. Both of us turned serious as Alan closed the gap of the door and pulled themselves further into the booth with me. I pulled myself back against the shelves, but Alan came in closer. Their eyes transfixed on the heavily tinted windows. Alan hushed me as my eyes looked upon their soft but prominent cheekbones. Their eyes squinted as they tried to focus. Don't move. They whispered. If we stand still against the shelf, then we'll blend in with the books. The windows should obscure us a lot. A sweet trace started to spoil off Alan. A flowery perfume or floral cologne, which made its way around me, encircling me, entrapping me. It was nice. It was intoxicating. 
and it fitted how Alan looked so well. Crisp yet soft, fresh but warm, entrancing though gentle. My eyes lingered on Alan's face as my brain tried to tell me how it looked. How did it look? The scent swirled deep down into my lungs and heart and sent them into overdrive. It was like my heart was going to leap from my chest. Everything else in the booth faded from sight as my breathing became erratic. My heart led an irregular beat. My throat braced as my guts twisted, both hands clung onto the hard wooden shelves behind me. I felt sweat burn down my forehead. Alan's head snapped back towards me, realising my state. My legs started to shake as my eyes were locked forward, now looking into their full dulcet lips. My heart grew hard. It was like it was solidifying and weighing me down from the inside. My muscles ached as I felt the ground pulling me down. I felt a shatter within as my heart turned to milk and trickled down my tricky innards. Alan's lips moved, curiously then seriously, then shocked. I let out a breath and I couldn't stand. Alan grabbed one arm under mine, up to my neck, and the other on my waist. Their legs pushed up on my knees and kept me standing. Their voice slowly started to come back to me. Hey, 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 come on, talk to me. What's up? What's going on? I didn't know how much time had passed. It felt like hours that I could only remember a minute of. As soon as I grew aware again, I pushed myself back up on, against the shelf to prop myself up. My eyes were wide and my lips were trembling. Oh God, I had a panic attack. Did anyone see? Did I break anything? Did I throw up? Was it embarrassing? My eyes readjusted and I saw Alan standing in front of me with one hand on my forehead. Hey, you with us? You're really hot. What happened? I'm sorry. It's okay. Hey, you have nothing to be sorry for. Are you okay? My breathing grew heavy. I felt like crying. I'm making them uncomfortable. I just know it. Oh, I shouldn't have come. I knew something like this would happen. I shouldn't have come at all. They probably find me weird. They hate me. Was that an anxiety attack? Yeah. Alan took a light step backwards. Am I making you uncomfortable? Was this me? It wasn't you. I started. My heart skipped a beat again and a chill ran down my spine. It was suddenly very cold in the small booth. Not really. I was making me uncomfortable. It's a me problem. Not you. You're great. You really are. I just have real trouble handling this stuff. It's hard for my body to stand any of it. I don't know how to say it right. You don't have to say it right. Alan reassured me. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You don't have to be perfect. If you mess up a few words, then that's okay. You can just try again. It costs nothing to start a sentence again, I assure you that. Just speak freely. How do you feel? I swallowed. The shelves that my fingers rested on grew cold, so I closed my hands into fists. Ignoring them, ignoring all extremities, trying to forget my body altogether. But my heart saw them standing in front of me and I hated it. It beat faster trying to break free and run away. Alan is great. Why can't my dad organ see that? They've done nothing wrong and yet my innards are trying to stop all functions and kill me as if Alan was a disease that my body was trying to flush out through a fever. I guess that made sense to my body. I can't feel awkward if I'm bloody dead. A shiver shot through my body. I can't. I told them. It's anxiety in talking to you. I don't know. It's like thinking about where I am and what I'm doing. This social situation is too much. Okay. Alan said. I understand. You do? Yeah, I used to have anxiety. Extreme anxiety. Couldn't even look at my own parents in the eye without having a panic attack. I used to go weak at the knees around someone I had a crush on, could barely stand alone, let, let alone talk to them. And look at me now, I'm standing all right, I guess. I got better, but I was trapped with it for so long because I was frightened to do anything to get rid of it. It's like it tries to eat itself, which also keeps it alive, but also hurts it. Like an Oberos of your own creation, but it's not. It's like a disease and it's not your fault. It's nothing to be ashamed of. And being scared of it only makes it stronger. How did you get rid of it? Alan snorted lightly. No, I never got rid of it. I got around it. I'm still trying to get rid of it. Cognitive behavioral therapy and all. But I still always have the fears whispering in my ear, pretending that it's my own voice, convincing me it's my own thoughts, when it's just germs that sound like my voice. You know, the earliest days were the worst, but you just have to push through some of your anxieties to get what you need. How did you get around it then? Well, for me, I just always imagined I'm somewhere safe. For me, I feel safe in my living room alone with the television on. So when I'm out and with people, like here with you, most of the time, I'm just picturing myself standing in my living room and you're just on the TV when you say something I have to reply to. I feel like there's a certain disconnect that if I say something wrong, then it's no bother because you're just on TV and I can try again. It helps a little. 
it's not the best and it's only a temporary thing hopefully but it kind of helps when talking to people it's like lying in bed thinking about conversations from years ago what was said what you should have said but didn't and because you're alone with no pressure you can come up with much better responses because i'm picturing this future reminiscence while actually being in the moment i'm therefore able to come up with the responses in the actual moment boom time travel baby It keeps you in your comfort zone while getting used to being out of it. It's an interpersonal challenge. Would you like to try it out? Interpersonal. About relationships between people. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's worth a shot. Let's try it. Okay. Okay, where do you feel safe? In bed? In the shower. In the shower. Alan smiled. Okay, we can work with that. Okay, what do you do in the shower? Where does your mind go? Keep it PG or don't. I won't judge. I snorted a little, leaving a smile. I uh, think about memories and stuff, maybe having internal conversations about how things went. I'm actually very well spoken in my mind, believe it or not. Aren't we all? Okay, great. Picture yourself standing in the shower. To help you feel like you're really there, imagine you're just standing away from the water for a minute because it's too hot. And also you're wearing your dungarees in there because they're very undoubtedly fashionable and should be worn everywhere. Yeah, they are. They really are. Good. Okay, you there? My eyes were closed. The feeling of the shelves holding me up translated over to the shelves at the back of the shower and Alan turned into a blank wall ahead. It was easy to talk because it was nothing, like that place your mind goes to when you're thinking of things that aren't really visual. Just a peripheral void. I'm there. Great. Now, what happened the other night? How did you feel about it? It was almost like Alan had become my own soundless inner voice, asking a question I ask myself all of the time. For that moment, it was like I was alone. I did only have myself to talk to, and nothing was weighing on me to get everything right. A cold breeze did try to remind me of where I was, like a whisper that I'm absolutely not alone and not safe, and I was being watched, warning me that if I made an awkward face or mispronounced something or passed gas, then it would all be over. But I pushed on. Well. I started. At first, I was terrified. I had no idea what to do. And then they grabbed me and pulled me into booth. In the moment, I didn't have any agency. I honestly just wanted out of the situation, but didn't want to be rude. But as we talked, I started to like them. My body didn't know, obviously. Elaborate? Alan asked quietly. I think they were trying to get me to go deeper without sounding like there was someone else there. Like I'm just expanding on it naturally. Not through any external input. Okay, well, I have anxiety. That's a thing. It's not a stress thing or a work thing or a performance thing. It's all interpersonal. Nice word. Thanks. I found it myself. Yeah. Okay, sure. I smiled but continued. I haven't had a good history making friends or making any sort of connection. I've always just sort of been in the background, I guess, because I haven't had any experience in it. My brain doesn't like it. It's too alien for me, too scary. So developing relationships with anyone frightens me and regardless of how badly I want it, even if I don't want one at all, it's like my brain will do anything to get me out of it. So just eye contact can seem like a minor development of a relationship, even if it's just passing someone in the street, and that can trigger my brain to try and shut down. It's like it doesn't know what to do, so it just tries to commit seppuka. It becomes harder to focus, to hear, to see, to breathe, to stand. It's like the world falls apart around me, The ground turns from a solid to a liquid like gold to milk. I lose my sense of sight and time and awareness. As all I see is myself, my heart feels like it turns to milk and my insides knot up like they've been touched by Midas. It doesn't know what's wrong so it tells me I must be sick. So it tries to make me throw up to get whatever is bothering me out. Even talking about it or thinking about it makes me feel a little sick. But thankfully... I'm just in a nice and clean place. My shower, where all disease-causing bacteria is washed away, right? Yes, says I. Totally your shower curtain. A wide smile crossed my face. I don't have a shower curtain. Then I am your soap, hello. I am soap. Insert things a soap would say. Ah. I sighed. Classic soap. Alan started giggling. You know, me... And no one else. It really sucks of how laborious this thing is. Soap disapproves of this vocabulary appropriation. Soap's gonna get it in a sec. 
Oh, what you gonna do? Put me in your dungaree pocket? I pulled my leg forward, lightly kicking at the tap, which laughed and said, Ouch. Okay, okay. Go on. I know what a boar says. You know, it's a snake that eats itself in a circular sort of way. But yeah, anxiety really is like that. Soap. You don't get the right connections or experiences, so you're not used to them, and you worry, and when the opportunity to get them finally presents itself, you're so worried that it'll go wrong, so unfamiliar with how to navigate them that you reject it. You push yourself away, and so you get more used to not having these experiences, and so more worried when they come along, repeating the cycle. It perpetrates itself. The only way to get out of it is to have the experiences, but now you're used to being worried about it, so it's harder to get them. I've been told that to get through them, I have to push, go for it. But if I could do that, then there isn't a problem at all. I wish I could go for it and get the experiences and have that, be that. But that is not how it works. It's self-perpetrating. And it really sucks when you're surrounded by people who just don't understand. They've all had experiences they need. They know what they're doing. So it's easy for them. Everyone has bloomed but me. They've shown personalities, colour and confidence. I feel like a child, unable to put things together or grasp certain things. Social cues suck. Well, they tell me never to fall in love because they've loved and lost. And I'm just there alone and lost. And they hurt over the good times that they'll never get back. But I look back and just see others having good times. They tell me how great it is to finally sit down when I've barely had a chance to stand up. I need them for me to get to their level, but they make it so hard. Hell is other people, but so is heaven. Wow, pretty poetic. (sighs) Thanks, Soap. No problem, weirdly dressed person in a shower talking to Soap because talking to people is hard. Well, it's not hard all the time. Being the first to talk is nearly impossible. I need weird but charming unfiltered people to drag me into conversations. I can respond when people talk to me, if they talk to me. But most of the time my anxieties hold me tight and stop me from responding with anything good. Instead, just make me say what is needed to say, nothing more. I always come off as passive and blank, like I'm not all in there. I'm a person inside. I'm not blank of passive or made of milk. I'm alive and I can be fun and suave and expressive and witty, if only in a mirror. Or to a soap. Yeah, though I'm not fully myself yet. I mean, I've had fun with you, soap, but I still feel like you've only skimmed the surface of who I am. That's normal for first conversations. I mean, I know as much about you as you know about me. I guess I would like to get to know you better, though. Oh, really? Yeah. By the way, I'm talking to the real you, not the soap. I figured. Alan pointed out as I opened my eyes, they were leaning back lightly on the door of the booth, strong enough to open it a little, but not enough to make it obvious to anyone outside as they watched through the crack they made. I would also love to get to know you better, too. To be honest, you've done great. I've had a panic attack. I said, crossing my arms. I have that effect on people. Alan smiled, crossing their arms, too. I walk into a room and they just faint. Okay, sure. I believe you. You should. Alan smiled, glancing back at me facetiously. I am very believable. Did you know I convinced someone that I was soap once? No way. Yes way. You see, they were tripping hard in a weird phone booth and I just started messing with them. Wow. And how did that person react? I asked them, uncrossing my arms and pulling myself from the shelves to stand up straight. Took it surprisingly well. Alan replied, standing off the door, mirroring me. Handed it all like a champ. Kicked me a little, but didn't hurt. They really opened up and kind of explored their anxiety and origins. It got a little deep. Sounds like that guy was really brave. Oh yeah, didn't question it for a second. Took it in stride. Alan pointed at the frame of the booth. Not once did they point out the horrible colouring in this booth. Seriously? I didn't think it was that bad. Come on, why does such an easy colour to get gross stuff on? I'd say it looks creamy. That makes it worse. Reminds me of milk left out too long. The gold just looks pretentious. Well, milk is good for you and gold is valuable. It's symbolism, big dude. Big dude, that's adorable. Alan said, leaning in and rubbing my head. I rolled my eyes but didn't fight back. 
They then took a finger to my chin and lifted it up so I was facing them. My eyes looked to their forehead, keeping away from their eyes. Gold has no practical value and milk can go off. Worth is what we make of it. For example, I think this booth is just totally awful, but I'll have fond memories of it because I met you. I'm not that great. You're relatable, fashionable, you can be feisty and banterous. We've had a shower together and we both love the Kama Sutra. You saw that. I turned red. <laughs> oh yeah, I saw it the second you grabbed it and I was just waiting for you to figure it out. God, that's so embarrassing. It is. Luckily, I like the person who did it, so it came off as cute. Also, they hella tripping, so they did so many more embarrassing things too. I laughed feeling less embarrassed. Yeah, poor guy. Actually, I don't get what this inside joke is, or what it means at all. Hey, I came up with the being on a bad trip. You started the bit about referring to yourself in third person. Okay, maybe we're just awkward. Adorably so. Yeah. I nodded. Hey, uh, thank you for being so understanding about everything, and keeping me up when I fell. I really appreciate it. You've actually really made this night worth it for me. Also, talking with you has helped me think a lot less and somehow that's working. So either you've broken me or this is how normal people function. Yeah, I wouldn't know. I'm just a soap talking to my television. That caught me off guard and I let out a bellow. Shh, Alan giggled. You'll give us away. At this point, I said quite loudly. I don't think the seeker is doing a very good job. However, I think I've spoken more to you than anyone else at this party. I mean, all interactions with all of them combined. Wow, we must really be hitting it off. Or maybe you just kidnapped me and have been standing in the way of the only escape. Well, yes, but I think it's because we're hitting it off as well. I mean, I've invested a lot of time into this kidnapping. I might as well make a good connection here. Yeah, I get that. I'd say we're hitting it off, but that could just be Stockholm Syndrome. Maybe, but that's basically what relationships are between extroverts and introverts. Could be. I nodded, looking down at the ground. Could be. I stood down for time as thoughts started to rush back to me. This was going really well, but where was it going? What was going to happen next? I should be leaving at this point. I've had more than enough social interaction today. And if I stay, I might just start getting on the nerves, and I don't want that. Stop! Alan said, reaching an arm out and resting on my shoulder. What? Say it. Say what? I see you overthinking there, sweetie. Stay in the moment with me, and if you have anything to think, say it too. It's safe here. We'll figure out the worth of those thoughts. It was just the usual fear of the future of this conversation. That sort of thing. No, oh boy. Alan moaned, leaning back. I leaned back too, crossing my arms with a raised brow. That gets us nowhere. Don't think about the end game of a talk unless you have a specific goal. Otherwise, we'll bury ourselves deep. We can do better than that. All right, Terrell Mike, what should we talk about? Let's talk about the fact that you haven't looked at my face one single time this entire therapy session. Alan mentioned crossing their arms and leaning forward. I didn't want to say the entire time because I already used time in the sentence and it sounded weird. It was a decision on the spot and I'm sticking with it. I smiled. Okay. Don't change the subject, television chick. You don't want to look into my eyes because your brain will fear a relationship change, right? Yep. I said quickly, turning red again. As far as I know. Do it. Nope. You are at this point probably my best friend, and since you pretty much said that we've talked more than you have with anyone else, I want to consider myself your best friend too. You think highly of yourself. I smiled, leaning forward. I mean, we've showered together, and we've already agreed we want to be closer than that. Oh my god, we have. So I feel like at this point, eye contact is a bit overdue. Do it. Okay, Darth Sidious, cool it. It needs to be special. Don't think about it. Don't mentally describe what my face looks like. Don't spend any time digesting it. Just see it, and then you can look away. I'll look up past your shoulder so you feel more comfortable. All right, thanks. Alan faced off as I took a deep breath. My eyes started darting around as I brought my head up. The booth had become really hot, and it felt like my eyes were going to water up. I couldn't let that happen. That would be embarrassing. I had to get this over and done with. I looked ahead into their eyes. They were eyes, all right, good-looking ones too, staring over mine. Alan brought them down, looking into mine. I was engulfed. At first I wanted to look away, a habit, an instinct, but their eyes were not looking back in disgust, anger or shock, but instead with glee. They were bright and colourful and warm, oh so potent. I'd never felt closer to someone. I'd never felt so connected. A thousand things conveyed unsaid as my eyes started to water up. We smiled. My heart turned to milk. You have... 
Yes? Alan asked as I wiped at my eyes. I laid her on, and those little spikes on your side. Alan started to laugh. <laughs> Winged eyeliner, yeah. <laughs> They've been like this the whole night. I haven't noticed them before. Of course not. Alan smiled as I started to look down again. How do they look? They look really good on you. Really good. I said, my body starting to shake. Why now? Everything was going so well. I'm having fun. We're making a connection. This is good for you. Why must you try and ruin it? I held my breath before it could become unusual. Thank you. No one had mentioned them tonight and I was getting nervous. Yeah, I... I think they're great. You okay? I exhaled and my whole body shivered. My gut started to knot up. My vision started to wobble. It was happening again. I went too far. I should have quit while I was ahead. Stay with me, dungarees. Stay in the moment. Whatever happens, happens. Don't think about the end game. My stomach turned to acid. My heart trickled down like a fuse. My throat braced and my skin turned to rock. This was quicker than it had ever been before. I don't think I can backtrack on this one. I grabbed the shelves as the ground started to sink around me. I opened my mouth. I'm sorry. I need air. Alan stepped to the side and opened the door. I pulled myself up, ready to move, and the blast of cold wind hit me. The same cold wind that swirled around me when I was outside alone. I didn't miss it. I acclimatised to the booth and the warmth I shared with Alan. It was good in here, and to go back would be like returning to what was. That wasn't right. I couldn't go back. I couldn't backtrack either. That wasn't healthy. I have to get through this. Go for it. In the moment. Get the experience. I reached for Alan's hand and they reached back. Our fingers entwined as heat rolled over us both. I pulled them close, my mouth reaching up to theirs. Alan did not react, did not push away or pull in, instead relaxing down to my level in a calm surrender. My arms wrapped around them and theirs squeezed back at me as their body pressed it back against mine. We fell into each other as their lips, like two bright wings, brought me into a fresh, timeless Eden. Connection. The eyes were like the opening into our souls, but the mouth was the opening to the heart. Feelings shared, unspoken and felt. We drank each other's vowels, a discussion without any words, just skin against skin. The contact of mouths, minds and mankind. Their body fell away in their rough embrace, their insides and outsides forgotten and replaced with the standing moment of connection. And the world washed away as both sets of lips, utterly committed to the moment, shared the supportive bliss between them. The thought of their bodies beyond touch did linger but did not press, the rotting mind frozen like a flower among fallen snow. Time had faded, the world avoid, the cold evaporated and our shelves ignored. It lasted a moment and forever. Our shared connection broke apart, but neither of us were broken. The wind rushed through us as our bodies returned, from lips, then eyes, then skin, and torsos and clothes. Our hands sunk down to our chest, clasping each other gently. The light of the booth faded back in. The setting around us returned to its all viable visage. My eyes were locked onto theirs, a smile crossed our mouths as if they were still one. Alan pressed their forehead against mine. Don't think, just stay with me here. Let me do the socialising. Socialising? What happened? Another pressure was felt. The wind was changed and the temperature uneven. My eyes glanced over their shoulders to see another figure standing in the dark, just beyond the open door. As it came back to me, I recalled something being said a second ago from there, though it didn't stick in my mind at all. I didn't think of it. My heart started to pound, but Alan raised a hand to my cheek, dancing over my skin before confidently landing on my shoulder. The half turned to the other. Sorry, what did you say? The voice replied with a curious tone. The words were unimportant to me. My eyes were still fixed on Alan's own, my mind still on them, and my body didn't seem to fear the future, instead steady in the moment. The other claimed they had found us, though we did make it obvious with the door open, but they moved closer and asked if we were here the whole time. I snorted a little. Sort of. Alan looked back, confused for a moment, before catching on. Yeah, kind of. The other told us we couldn't move after we found a place and asked where we were. The shower. I told them, still looking at Alan. Yeah. Alan added. And we were with some guy tripping hard. It's a whole story. The other, unbothered by our tall tales, turned and called out that they found us too before fading away to find the others. Alan took my hand. You ready to move back to the party? Maybe. With you. Possibly. If at any point after this case I faint. If you faint, I'll catch you. I'm there to sweep you off your feet again. I think. I smiled. If you're there, my turtleneck soap... I think you'll keep me standing. The End by Thomas McClure Read by Ellie Hughes, Emma McClure and William Byers